Good morning. Please turn in your Bibles with me to Luke 12, uh, verse 13 through 34. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to a man, Who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have made ample goods. Uh, you have ample goods laid out for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Verse 22. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life and what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... How much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions. Give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give you praise this morning that we can gather and we can worship you. Father, I pray that you would bless our sister, Ate Sally. I pray that you'd make our way finally to the end to go back to the Philippines. Thank you for the time that we've had with her, how she's been part of this church, what she means to so many here. We just praise you for your grace and your mercy on her and on us. We thank you for your provision. May we now look into your word and see what you would have for us. Teach us, we pray and ask in Christ's name. Amen. John D. Rockefeller was an American businessman who lived from 1839 to 1937. He is known for being one of the first businessmen to ever discover or recognize the significance of oil, petroleum, and he started a company to begin drilling and refining and selling oil. As president of Standard Oil, the company, he grew the company to be one of the largest in the country. And at one point, he controlled 90% of the world's petroleum. Production, drilling, refining, selling, he controlled 90%. And this led to him becoming the wealthiest person in the world at the time. There seemed to be no end to his, his wealth. In fact, he was worth at one point $1.4 billion dollars when the GDP of the U.S. was $24 billion. So he owned a significant amount of the U.S. wealth. In fact, comparatively, there's never been anyone as wealthy as him. And when asked by a journalist how much money was enough for one man, he answered, just a little bit more. John Rockefeller had more money than he would ever be able to spend. He controlled vast sectors of the U.S. economy. He had a monopoly on the production of petroleum. And yet, it was not enough. Before you think, okay, pastor, I know where you're going. 
but this has nothing to do with me. I'm not John D. Rockefeller. I'm just a poor, humble servant of God trying to get by in life. Well, friends, you may not have $1.4 billion, but you and I are still human. We face the same temptation as Rockefeller, the same temptation as the man we'll see in our passage this morning, the same temptation as the rich fool. We just need a little more. And as we will see, the warning Jesus gives to the crowd and to this rich fool is one we need to hear today. Life is not about the abundance of possessions. Jesus reveals to his disciples and to us another secret of the kingdom. Where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. So friends, it's my prayer this morning that this passage today from the Bible would set you free from the anxieties and fears of this life, to have a hope and confidence in our Father in heaven who is giving us the kingdom, and that our hearts would treasure the greatest treasure of all time, Jesus Christ, our Lord. How do we do this? How do we rightly value what we should as Christians? How should we treasure Christ above all things? Well, as we look at our text this morning, we're going to answer these questions, and we're going to do, through, do that through four scenes. First, we're going to look at the problem. Second, we'll look at the parable. Third, we'll look at the provision. And number four, we'll look at the promise. So number one, let's look at the first scene, the problem in verses 13 through 15. Verse 13 says, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And if you look earlier in chapter 12 of Luke's gospel, a crowd has gathered around Jesus. Many thousands are coming around Jesus, listening to him as he teaches them. And he's warning them of a number of different things. He's warning them about uh, the leaven of the Pharisees. Don't listen to the teaching of the Pharisees, which is hypocritical. He instructs them to have no fear of death, but the fear of the one who can send them into hell. And he's encouraging them to acknowledge the Son of Man himself before other men. Luke 12, 1 through 12, records some of the most important teachings of Jesus to his followers. And in in the midst of these life and death teachings, verse 13, there's this man who says, hey, tell my brother to split the money from the inheritance with me. In the middle of Jesus' important instruction to his followers, thousands of people, a heckler from the crowd, demands that Jesus settle a dispute with his brother. Everything about this man's appeal to Jesus shows us how little he thinks of Jesus and his teaching and how his desire is driven by greed. Instead of calling Jesus master or Lord or rabbi, the man calls him a much lower title, just merely calls him teacher. This man is not asking for Jesus to hear the argument between him and his brother and therefore bring a wise ruling after considering the case. Instead, the man is trying to co-opt, trying to grab onto Jesus' authority. And he's doing so for personal gain. doesn't seem like he's interested in resolving some injustice or trying to keep a reconciliation with his brother. Instead, the matter has gone beyond resolution between the two parties, and so he appeals to Jesus as a third-party authority. Jesus is just a tool to be used to get what he really wants, money. And much of what we know about this man and his request, we see in the text from Jesus' response. Jesus responds to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? Now, the irony of this is that certainly Jesus is God himself. He is the one with all authority to judge in that particular situation, right? He certainly has the authority to do that. But here, Jesus isn't going to be this kind of judge that the man wants. He isn't going to step in between this family squabble and decide who gets what. Instead, Jesus is going to judge his heart when it comes to what is truly there. This man is suffering from a covetous heart, desiring things beyond 
his needs. He has great desire to, bes- to possess something that is not his. Friends, too many think that they can do the same thing with Jesus today. Jesus is a great tool, a stepping stool to get what you truly desire. Money, wealth, prestige, right? And if you've come here today hoping to gain something valuable by being part of this church service, right? If you're trying to get some sort of material gain, maybe some respectability as you come into the church, if you're trying to get anything other than Jesus himself, you were just as blind as this man. With Jesus teaching right in front of him, this man cannot see what he truly needs. By the way, this is the ultimate evil of the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel, which is no gospel, obscures Jesus and his saving work by holding more important earthly riches. So Jesus then warns everyone present in verse 15. He says to the crowd, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Jesus knows this man's heart. He knows his desires better than he does, and he can see deep down in this man's heart his desire for wealth, for an abundance of possessions. And Jesus knows that it is blinding him to the true treasure that stands before him. This is the problem. So Jesus warns the crowd, life is not about the pursuit of possessions, wealth, treasure, and money. The next scene, Jesus uses a parable to show how deep and dangerous this problem really is. Remember last week when I introduced this summer series on the parables, I said that Jesus uses parables, these simple stories, using elements of everyday life to teach us about the kingdom of God. And so he does the same thing here. He gives a parable to unpack the depths of this dangerous belief. Here he says in verse 16, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store my grain and my good. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. We have this example of this rich man in the parable. And notice what this man thinks the problem is. Already rich, he has this problem of having produced more than he can store. He has an excess, an, an excess, an abundance. What a problem to have, right? You might be thinking, I wish I had that same problem. I know what I would do. Imagine somehow your digital bank account could not fit any more money in it. And if you find yourself chuckling, thinking something along the same lines as this rich man, Jesus has you pegged. This parable is for you. What is the solution to this man's problem? He's going to build a bigger barn. I build a larger one. And again, in verse 18, it says, This man is already rich. He already has enough for his own personal needs. He has barns already, and those barns are full from last year's harvest, and yet he wants more. So he builds bigger barns, he stores up the crop, and he says to himself, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. And I wonder how many of you can relate to what this man says to his own soul. How many of you believe that the essence of life is to get to a place of being able to say, relax, eat, drink, and be merry? What better place to be than to have this kind of comfort and security in life? To have finally made it where you've saved all the money from your hard work here in the UAE, and you've diligently planned for the future, and maybe you've built a home or a business in your home country, where you'll be able to do just that, 
Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But is this what life consists of? What does Jesus have to say about a life aimed at these things? I want you to see how this man talks about himself. Notice how many times he refers to himself in this parable. Verse 17 says, He says to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. Verse 18, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones where I will store my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Relax. Between this man, his wealth, and his pursuit of happiness, God does not come into the equation. The pursuit of possessions, the preoccupation for more things, have left him deceived. He is deceived in that he thinks that all the things he has, whether crops or barns, possessions, or even his own soul, are somehow his. When they are not. God is the one who holds all those things. God is the one who granted him the crops to grow, who gives him the knowledge to yield a crop, who gives him each day that he lives, and yet he thinks he owns it himself. He is deceived into thinking that he is master of his own domain. He's also deceived in thinking that he will always have this particular crop, that he'll have this time to enjoy it, that it'll somehow last forever, at least to the end of his life. And he doesn't realize that the grain is going to outlast him. Verse 20 says, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? This man has no idea that not only does he not really control the crop that he harvested, he has no control over his own life. Here he is making plans for in his old age, to continue to enjoy what he has acquired. And in the end, he loses both his life and his wealth, which he cannot take with him. And so Jesus looks at this rich man and says, you are a fool. Why? He says, you're a foolish person to live your life in pursuit of wealth. Verse 21, so was the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This is the crux of the problem that the parable lays out. Jesus is not saying it's wrong to make a lot of money. He says what matters is what you do with it. Do you lay up treasures for yourself alone and are not rich toward God? I think there's a lot of people who look at this rich man and think, man, this guy is wise. I mean, he's like a killer businessman. Look at this. I mean, he's incredibly wealthy. He's filled his barns. Look, he's got more wealth. Go get a bigger barn. Absolutely. Who doesn't want to be in that similar situation, right? The point is is that this man, this fool, doesn't realize he has a massive debt to God. He'll have to give an account for his life, for his sins. And in the parable, he has given no thought to who God is. What good will his treasure do when he dies? None. No good. It's going to go to somebody else, and he won't be able to enjoy it. Death is this great barrier, right? It's the ultimate reset to all our earthly goods. Really, we are all this rich fool. We think that tomorrow we're going to live, and we're going to go back, I'm going to go to my favorite shawarma place, and it's going to be awesome. In some ways, we are like him. We believe we control our destiny. We believe we own what we own, that it's ours. This is the way of the world. We don't realize that death is coming, and soon we will stand before the holy God with nothing to offer him. There's no payment that you and I can offer for our sins. Everything you have is God's already. What do you hope to use? What can you give in order to appease a holy God? 
Thanks be to Jesus, whose blood covers us. Only by Christ's death on the cross is the Father's just wrath turned away. What could be more valuable than Christ who saves us? Who opens our eyes to the spiritual truth to see the Father? And how utterly terrible it is for those who cannot see the full wealth of riches in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who somehow prize money and their life now, but do not consider what they need to stand before a holy God for eternity. Friends, we've seen the problem. The parable has helped draw it out for us even more. And so now, so now we move to scene three, the provision, verses 22 through 30. Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. I want to point out Jesus' argument here. Jesus was interrupted by a man who wanted the inheritance from his brother. He warns against that covetousness, saying that the life is more than the abundance of our possessions. And then he tells about a parable of a rich fool who gets richer, storing all his wealth in bigger and bigger barns, but dies that very day. And he is a fool because he is not rich toward God. You might be thinking, hey, I'm not that wealthy. I barely make it each month. I come from a poor country. I have a job that barely makes any money. I'm not the rich person storing up wealth for myself. Maybe you're not the business owner here, the person with a high salary that, I, that uh, there are many, of course, right, in the UAE that are making money. We have this wide disparity between those who make a lot and those who don't make a lot. And maybe you feel like, I'm on this end. We have this wide disparity, I think, even in this church. Some here make a lot of money. Some make, don't make that much money, comparatively. But praise God for His provision for you, whatever that is. But the same principle applies to you as well. Don't store up riches, however small in your eyes, to yourself and not be rich toward God. Whether you make little or make a lot, God is the one who provides for us all and He owns it all. So if you're one who thinks, well, I don't make any money. I don't make nearly like what other people make. That does not absolve you from what Christ demands of you. That does not absolve you from being a steward of what God has given you in His provision. Notice what He says after this parable. He says, Therefore, so in light of everything that I've told you, do not be anxious about your life. Don't worry about your body, your clothing. Don't worry about food. Verse 23 says, For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Jesus says, Stop worrying about the two most basic things in your life, food and shelter, the ba most basic of which is clothing. Why can we stop worrying about these things? Because life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Earlier, Jesus said in verse 15 that life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. It's not about gaining all that you can, filling one's life with as much stuff, wealth as possible. Now, he says, nor is your life about getting food and clothing. Jesus is pointing to both ends of the spectrum. It's not about massing amounts of wealth, nor is it about being preoccupied with getting your daily needs met. It's, not, it's neither relentlessly pursuing wealth, nor is it scrounging around for a bare minimum to live. Your life, my life, is not to be defined by the things we have, the money we make. The life we live as Christians is to be defined by the kingdom. Of course, we need things, right? It is God Himself who provides our daily bread, the food that we need. And this is why Jesus makes these two arguments using both birds and flowers to illustrate the care by which we ourselves will be cared for. Verse 24 says, Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than birds? Think about this. You're in the crowd around Jesus. He's teaching. 
and he's teaching on these difficult topics. He's giving you this parable. He's telling you, don't worry about your life. Your life is more than just food and clothing. And then he points to birds in the air, ravens flying around, eating. Everybody knows ravens, birds. They see how they fly around. They hunt and gather. They're provided for. God's created them. He feeds them. They have no barns or storehouses. And yet, they survive. They thrive. Friends, you and I are more valuable than birds. Therefore, God is going to also provide for us. He points to the lilies in the fields, his wild wildflowers, they're growing all around them. And think about the, the short life a weed or a flower growing out in a field. Well, out here they would die like that. But in other places, maybe a season, maybe a week. And then you got to, where I'm from, you mow the lawn and the grass, you just throw the grass away. So as, as short a life as that, God cares for and, and dresses the flowers in the field. Friends, you and I are eternal beings, embodied souls. We'll live forever. And so, of course, God is going to care for us. He's going to clothe our bodies and care for our lives because we're much more value than any plant. He also adds in verse 25, which of you by being anxious can add a single hour of his span of life? If you're not able to do a small thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? What does anxiety actually do? It doesn't do anything. Some of us here are probably lean on the more anxious side, maybe. You tend to worry about things. You know who you are, right? Uh, when you hear about in the news something happening, cases of COVID spiking, it just hits you a little differently than other people. And you tend to worry about it. Maybe you worry about your own existence. If you're going to renew that contract next year, Maybe you worry about your kids, how they're going to do. There's plenty of things you would think. There's some things to be anxious about. And yet, God says, you can't add another hour to your life, right? Yours and my date when we leave this earth is fixed in the heavens. Only the Lord knows what time that is. And just like the rich, young fool, the rich fool, the Lord knows when our souls will be demanded of us. That is the Lord's priority. So anxiety about these things is fruitless, helpless, and I think displays a true hopelessness. Friends, I've been here six months, and I think I've heard more stories of particular ways the Lord has provided for people physically, with a house, with a job, with other basic necessities, than any other place I've been. I think it's because living in the UAE, it's like you're on this boat together, right? Right? The boat's moving, it's traveling around, it's always, you know, just on the ocean. Go with me on this analogy, okay? So the boat is floating, and people have to get on, and people have to get off. That's all the Lord's will. We don't know when, but uh, that's up to the Lord. But someday, everybody has to get off the boat. You can't live on a boat forever. You can't stay on a boat and so there's always these stories of how you got your visa, and I got my visa, and how long it took, and then I had to go through this thing. And, and we have maybe our stories, they're, they're little nightmares of like, oh, I had to go through this, I had to wait this long, I had to wait two months for that. But brothers and sisters, I've also heard a lot of stories about how the Lord's provided in really key ways, in key times, where He's showing you specifically it's Him who's coming at that moment to give you that thing that you need. That place to live, the job offer, the signed contract, the space that opens up for you to live with your family. And brothers and sisters, I encourage you to think on these, to remember the many ways the Lord has cared for you in your life, and share them with fellow church members. Rejoice and remember what He has done for you. Encourage a fellow member who may be praying for just such a provision in their life. I'm thinking about my own life. Back in 2017, I was in Indonesia. I'd been there a year, planned to live there the rest of my life, was with my family. I was pastor in an international church. And then I get a call from my sister. My parents were in a car wreck. They almost died. And for an entire month, they were in separate hospitals recovering. 
just one of the most painful things we've been through. And over the next six months, we realize we've got to move home. And that means after moving like 14 times in our marriage, my wife and I move again. We get rid of everything we own. We give up the job that we have. And with not a lot of money, we move back to the States. No job prospects. No plan for where we're going to live. And the Lord provided for us. And not just us, but for my parents as well. Massive ways. Huge ways. My parents, even through that collision, I don't call it an accident, through that car wreck, both were baptized. My mom became a believer and uh, started going to church. So I praise God for His provision even through those hard things. God works all things together for good. And He certainly did in that situation. So let's encourage one another in the many ways that He has done that. Even after this service, if you go to Alwada, we can talk about, man, this is the way the Lord has really provided and helped me and shown me His love for me. Well, why is this all important? What is it about anxiety over these things that is so dangerous? Verse 30, Jesus tells them the reason. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek His kingdom, and the things will be added to you. Friends, everybody on this planet is striving to get what they need, or maybe even striving to get more of what they don't need. You and I have a good Father. He knows exactly what we need more than we do. Let us not live in such a way that says to the world, we don't really trust our Heavenly Father. Because look at us. We worry just as much as you do about all these things. Let's not say that to the world that's watching. As Christians, we don't live in the same economy, the same universe when it comes to provision. The world can only see finite resources, a limited amount of food to go around, right? And you've got to protect what you have. You've got to hoard what, what is there around there so you can provide for your family, right? The pie is only this big. There are only eight slices. And if I give you one, then that person's not going to get one over there. So make sure you get what you have. But for the Christian, the one who has God as our Father, everything we have is His, and we are as free as the birds of the air, as resplendent as the flowers of the field. We have a God as our Father who provides for all that we need. There's no one pie with God. God either expands the pie or He just creates new pies. So there's plenty to go around. That's what Jesus does when He feeds the many thousands, over 5,000, right? Right? I don't know how many loaves of bread it was or how many fishes. It doesn't matter. All it knows is that there were 12 baskets full left over after he blesses them. It is no challenge to God to provide for the very children that he creates through the blood of his son. So let me ask you, what then are we to do as his children? If we're not supposed to be anxious and and strive after getting more things, or even worrying about oh, the bare necessities for life today, what are we to do? Verse 31 says, Instead, seek His kingdom, and these things will be added to you. This is the meaning of your life. It's not about an abundance of possessions. It's not about the daily grind of provision. It is to seek the kingdom of God. Jesus came announcing this kingdom of God to the people of Israel. In the midst of this teaching, the man in the crowd could only think about the inheritance that he might miss out on. And he doesn't realize that he is preoccupied with the things that he cannot keep, wealth in this world, and is so in danger of missing out on the treasure he cannot lose. A treasure that is in heaven, Jesus Christ. He doesn't see that in front of him is a far greater treasure being offered to him. Christ Jesus, the Savior. Well, this takes us to our fourth and final scene. So far, we've covered the problem, the, prayer, the parable, the provision. And finally, in scene four, we get to the promise. 
verse 31 again, Jesus gives the command, seek first the kingdom of God. This is the point of my life. This is the point of your life. This is the reason Jesus came to die, to rescue lost sinners. His death purchases for us a new life in him. The life we now live in Christ is not our own anymore. We were bought with a price. And we've been brought from the world in its ways, from the worldly values of money and possessions, and we are not to live like the world does. Like the rich fool who thought that what mattered most was maximizing enjoyment, pleasure through the comfort of wealth in this life. Jesus has come that we might not have life and life to the full in him. And that means we are to live for the kingdom of God. And so verse 32, he says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And we're just told to go seek the kingdom. And right after that, he gives us this great comforting word. Don't be afraid. It pleases your good Heavenly Father to give you that kingdom of which I told you to seek. He says, I will, it's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom, not sell you the kingdom, not rent you the kingdom. There's no exchange here. There's no transaction. There's nothing that you could give to God for this anyways. Our Father is pleased to give us the kingdom. And what we gain in Christ is a free gift of grace from our Father. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. But that doesn't stop the Father from welcoming all those who are His into His kingdom. And for some of you here, it, this may not sound like good news. Perhaps you are here as an unbeliever and you just can't imagine giving up what you own. You can't imagine not striving for what you have. You can't imagine being free from the anxiety of trying to provide for yourself or people around you. I hope you hear the good news of Jesus th this morning. Life is not about those things. True life, the everlasting life, is found in Christ alone. Seek the kingdom of God. Believe in Jesus. And you will have a Father in heaven whose good pleasure is to give you the kingdom. This offers not an IOU. It's not a promise of the future, although we fully realize it in the future. Today, you can know Jesus. So if you're here and you're not a believer, talk to myself, any one of us elders, pastors. We'd love to tell you more about what it means to follow Jesus and be set free from the prison of pursuing wealth. So let me ask you, brothers and sisters, how does what you do with what you own reveal what you treasure? Let me ask that one more time. How does what you do with what you own reveal what you treasure? How does the way you earn, spend, save, and give your money show that Christ is your highest treasure? If you were to show God your bank statement, what would it tell him? He already knows. If Christ is your greatest treasure, how do we honor him with all that we have? Well, Jesus concludes our passage this morning, verses 33 and 34. He says, sell your possessions, give to the needy, provide yourself with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. And where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Friends, when you have Christ, who is your life, the economics of life changes. You and I are given the best investment opportunity on the planet. Trade, <laughs> trade garbage now for eternal treasure. What can be better than that? What better investment can you make? And really, Jesus tells us to do two things with the treasure we have now. Jesus emphasizes two things. Give them away to the needy and invest in the kingdom. I don't think Jesus is saying here, don't have possessions. Walk around with nothing. 
I'm glad I have more than one shirt because I sweat in this weather and it would smell really bad after just a few days. No. But what we have should show whom we treasure. Let everything you own be used to show that you have a good God who provides and because of Christ who purchased it for us. So when you give to the local church, to the efforts of the gospel work around the world, to the furthering of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the aid of the saints like Sister Sally, who are hurting and suffering around you, you are declaring these things. Number one, when you give to these things, you're declaring everything I have is Christ. Number two, you're saying, I can give sacrificially and joyfully because Christ has given the greatest sacrifice. Number three, I, can, I can't outgive God. He is the one who has given first and has given most, and he will continue to be the one who gives. Number four, you're saying, I love Jesus more than I love these possessions. And number five, you're saying, Christ is my ultimate treasure. That's my prayer for you this morning, ECC. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we just pray, Lord, that you would keep us, protect us from this lie from Satan. There's not enough. You need just a little more. You've got to make sure you preserve everything you have because there won't be any more. Father, help us to see that this causes us to disbelieve that we have you as a good Father. Remind us again of what we've received in Christ as a gift. Treasure that cannot be measured, unending, overflowing. And Father, may we say, with everything that we have, we treasure Christ most. We thank you that we have these opportunities, that you give us these moments where we can bless other people, You've instructed us in your word and how we are to see the church advanced throughout the world. And you will do this. So we give you all praise and glory and honor this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.